My name's John Baker and I'm the Director of Counter Fraud and Corruption Services at Moore Stevens in the Forensic Accounting Department. Um, I've been there for 18 months, but I've actually been countering fraud and corruption for some 20 years in the public sector, not-for-profit and corporate side of things. Firstly, we need to understand why corruption happens. It's because one or any combination of the following, it can be low pay, a lack of transparency, it can be culturally acceptable within the country or the sector, so it becomes the rule rather than the exception. Monopolisation in sectors can lead to corruption, and too much discretionary power with one or two people within an organisation can lead to corruption. Quite often poor oversight leads to things like that, but most importantly it's tone at the top, and if that's wrong then corruption can become endemic throughout the organisation. How do you spot it? I think there are many indicators of corruption. These can range from unexplainable lifestyle, um, it can be bullying individuals, uh, people who will force their um, corruption through the whole organisation. You can also um, you know, identify people who have been recruited or promoted into positions in which they're not qualified for, not suitable for, not experienced for. Sometimes unusual business structures are an indicator of corruption and regular visits by the same uh, providers, suppliers, contractors, excessive hospitality can also be an indicator. Another one is an unusual turnover of staff, whether it be very high, people enter, they don't like the culture so they leave, or well, the turnover can be very low and that's because obviously they're benefiting from the corruption so why would they leave? The biggest case I was actually involved in uh, was last year and that was in Central Africa and it was for a humanitarian aid agency. According to the allegations, goods were being uh, cleared under the organisation's uh, name to evade tax and goods were then diverted for personal use. Furthermore, other allegations came in about kickbacks, about promotions, about staff loans, uh, land purchases, mismanagement in relation to construction, a whole heap of, um, of allegations. So we sent in a team of 15 and they were out there for three months and we actually pursued 69 separate lines of inquiry under the one investigation. Data was recovered from servers, from laptops, phones, PDAs, and we had to undertake a full stock take of a huge warehouse and the full vehicle fleet to actually understand what was happening. We also called in quantity and um, building surveyors because there were allegations about a build, uh, albeit um, a school, which um, may not have been the actual uh, final product. Um, we held interviews and as a result of this, a file was passed to the charity, which in turn was then passed to the uh, police. And that contained clear evidence of theft, corruption, fraud, uh, actually involved in the head of the organisation, 10 employees and one contractor. First has to be a robust uh, awareness, uh, anti-corruption and fraud awareness, and that's brought about through training. Um, if staff are then trained to spot the signs of corruption, it makes it easier for them to actually report it. The second is a denial of opportunity, so strong controls should be in place and, and actually applied, and this reduces the opportunity, which is one of the, um, the three areas of the fraud triangle. Effective leadership, um, having the right tone from the top for me is crucial. If that isn't right, then everything else fails as well. Um, you don't get the anti-fraud, anti-corruption culture. Um, you know, things are kicked back in terms of training, controls aren't applied. So actually having the effective leadership is uh, paramount. It's also important to have robust auditing regime um, in that A, it's a deterrent so that people know that things are going to get checked and therefore less likely to actually uh, conduct fraud or corruption, uh, but also just having an audit regime you know, will um, hopefully pick up some issues that can then be passed on to investigators. The other top tip is to have a robust pre-employment screening in place and making sure that you don't employ people who have a, a track record of corruption. You know, it's not infallible. I've dealt with many cases um, and investigated people who've got a clean record. That would never have, you know, there was nothing to pick up at the pre-employment stage. But again, it's a good deterrent uh, and actually sends out a message to would-be um, corruptors, would-be fraudsters, that the organisation takes it seriously. I think um, anti-fraud, anti-corruption culture is one of those things that it's very easy to say you need it and it's very hard to define and even harder to actually implement. 
but it comes it's it's a marathon it's not a hundred meter sprint and it comes through a whole series of things it's having the right person in place the tone from the top sending out the messages right throughout both the staff and the contractors and suppliers chain it's actually then raising awareness of what uh, corruption looks like so people are then trained to spot the indicators it's sending out the organization's um, ethical standards through policy through procedures so for instance it would be best practice for an organization when at the contracting stage to get a would-be supplier or contractor to agree to their anti-bribery and corruption policy um, acknowledge it and say that they'll adhere to it and it's really making sure that you drive home the message that corruption you know is not tolerated um, so statements are put out at board level reminders are issued even through simple things like text messages to staff put on the internet even on pay slips um, in areas where the IT is uh, poor uh, then you know you do have posters you can have somebody like a fraud and corruption champion who's not job it is but part of their day job to actually reinforce the message and bring to the attention of people you know new bulletins new alerts and the organization should be constantly reinforcing the message that fraud and corruption is a bad thing and will not be tolerated I think it's um, it's absolutely critical. Uh, without training, um, staff won't know what to look out for. They won't understand their role and their responsibilities. So having the right training in place is, uh, you know, an actual fundamental part of that anti-fraud corruption policy we've discussed. Telling staff through training, um, you know, what their role is, how they can actually reduce fraud and corruption, how to spot it, and more importantly, how to report it. All too often, without the correct training. Staff don't feel confident in being able to raise a concern. So if the training can reinforce what fraud looks like, what to do if you suspect fraud, and as importantly, if not more importantly, what not to do when you suspect fraud, and then actually giving them a route to uh, make that disclosure. And quite often that can be a route that goes around their line manager, because at this stage, you know, they may not know whether or not their line manager is involved. Well, Stevens um, International Network um, has been run with over 2,600 partners across the globe and has more than 27,000 staff. It's ranked in the top 10 and we have 636 offices across 105 countries. Uh, the member firms of Moore Stevens is an international wet network and since 2003 we've got a series of international funding offices um, and well, we call them international funding institutions, IFI offices and these are run directly by the London office and they cover the whole globe, East Africa, Central Africa, West Africa right through to uh, the Middle East and down into Asia. The International Institution's Donor Assurance Team, the IADA team, focuses very much on sort of donor assurance in which we get involved in a lot of corruption cases. Um, we've got over 100 staff in the London office and they work on international donor assurance, corruption investigations, fraud investigations. And amongst our clients are people like the World Bank, the African Development Bank, the UN agencies, the EU, the Global Fund and many government ministries. Uh, Moore Stevens and SIPFRA have been working closely over the last year to develop anti-corruption guidance and tools. We've held a number of anti-corruption workshops with over 50 people who have contributed their thoughts, ideas and best practice and we're collating these into guidance. In addition, we're also developing training to assist international organisations in their anti-corruption work.